All right, um, welcome. I'm super excited to talk to you guys today. Um, we are right about at Halloween time, uh, one of my favorite times of the year. Just kind of everything's changing, the fall's changing, just life's changing. Um, and so, we, you know, I, I wanted to put a little bit of a creepy kind of uh, metal band on as we start. Um, you know, I got my, uh, my Jaguar that I got um, probably 15 years ago in Mexico. Got the candle going. Hopefully I don't light anything on fire while we're shooting um, the video. Welcome. This is People's History. This is the third episode of um, Economic Colonial Trends um, is what we're basically talking about. Um, today we're going to be talking, um, you know, about one of the most serious issues in, um, at least in, in the world, really, honestly, you can't even say just the United States centric, um, slavery for basically about 366 years was, was one of the leading, um, economic trade entities in the world. Um, for example, about 12.5 million African slaves were transported, um, during that 366 years. Um, you know, that is called actually Africa Diaspora. Um, and basically it's when the African people came in contact with the Europeans. Um, and it led to this huge racial divide, at least for without a doubt in the United States. And we still feel a lot of those effects now. And so what the stuff that we're talking about is kind of how we got to where we are, but we're mostly going to be looking at it from like a historical academic, um, viewpoint as to how, why, and where, you know, these, the, the transatlantic slave trade took place. Um, kind of, you know, what conditions led to it, what factors kept it to be a viable um, economic entity for such a long time, and kind of why that was sustained. Um, so if we look at just some of the some of the main ideas, um, at least with the African diaspora, what we're talking about is the African culture injected so many different ideas into Western Civ. When you talk about music, art, cuisine, um, and along with the labor that they were forced to do during that time period as well. Um, so if we think about it in context, if we look, if we're looking at contextualization and we're looking be before the transatlantic slave trade, um, mo there was slavery still in existence, primarily in the Mediterranean um, and the Indian Ocean area, and that is heavily a result of the trade of sugar. Sugar is an extraordinarily laborious process. It takes a ton of manpower. It's really dangerous heating up the cauldrons and cooling it and all that stuff. Um, and so this is the area where we'd see a lot of slaves, and it continued during those 366 years from 1500 to about 1866. And sugar was a main factor in that, along with the pr production of tobacco and later towards with the, with the production of cotton as well. Um, so um, most of the times the ratio was two to one females, though, when you're talking about Mediterranean slave trade. And most of, that, most of those females worked in more of a um, domestic setting, um, helping the woman of the house. Um, but as sugar grew, the rise for slavery knew, um, grew as well. So before the introduction of sugar from the, um, from the Mediterranean, the English didn't have a lot of, they didn't have any sugar actually. So as we continue to look at that, that's kind of a factor because as you spread, remember we're, a lot of times when we're talking about in this section, we're talking about mercantilism and, and the strategy that the more um, products or the more raw goods that you have, the more powerful your nation. And unfortunately, during this time period, it meant people as well. When you're talking about slave labor, that is seen as a raw good to them. Something a little bit different than, you know, obviously how we feel now. It's like people are people, right? Um, so as I said, most of the time they were Slavic. That took place up until about... Um, the fall of Constantinople, and then those Slavic people were now under the Ottoman um, Empire, and so we saw less and less Slavic as a result. Um, <clears throat> and so during the 15th century, Portuguese was kind of exploring Africa, looking for gold, and what ended up happening was that they found the, a resource um, in slave labor, and kind of that, that's where it kind of emanated. Um, one thing we do need to understand is that the practice of slavery was was condoned at all levels, whether you're talking a king, queen, whatever, what have you. Um, in fact, in 1452, Pope Nicholas V actually said 
that all non-Christians must be sought out and, and if need be put into perpetual slavery. And so that shows that it's condoned from the Vatican down um, among the highest religious figure, well, the highest religious figure in, in Christendom during that time period. Um, some of the reasons why they chose the African slaves was because, first of all, they were extraordinarily good, skilled farmers. Um, and then we also have to think about the factor of the great dying in the Americas. There simply was not that slave um, or that resource of people similar to what the Spanish did where they had set up a hacienda system where not quite slavery but yet it's still kind of this oppression of the people and keeping their wages extraordinarily low and keeping them indentured into the dawns of the land reading the, the, the landowners you know and so they didn't have that in the colonial Americas the Caribbean and Brazil we have to keep in mind Brazil and the Portuguese were a major factor in the slave trade. In fact, more slaves were traded to Portugal, or excuse me, to Brazil, or taken to Brazil than the North American um, area, where we now know as continental U.S. Um, the one thing that was different about it is that Brazil had moved away from it before we did, or I should say the Portuguese had moved away from it before we did. We perpetuated that, um, we perpetuated that practice mu much longer than they did. Um, they were also non-Christian, which gave the Vatican approval to do so. And if you think about it in geographic terms, they're relatively closer than, say, the Middle East or Asia. Um, and so it was, it was quicker. And most of this took place on the west coast of Africa. Um, another key factor in it is flat-out racism. Um, and this can be seen traced back all the way to about the 14th century with the Islamic faith and calling the Africans less than human, um, and other, other historians might argue, like Arthur Smedley kind of argued that, um, racism is inherent in the European culture, at least during this time period. And kind of an example of that is the English view of the Irish, although neighbors and nearly, um, you know, extraordinarily close islands, there is still this viewpoint from the English of the Irish that they are above them, that the, um, the Irish race is something less has less quality than say the English race. And so kind of that European racist mindset that, you know, these, these people that are in Africa, um, we can justify that because they are not Christian. They're less than we are. Um, that kind of idea. And that idea spread, um, and, and continued, you know, well, well into the 20th century. Um, this idea that, you know, Af people of African descent are less than, um, we see it with lots of different minorities um, throughout the, at least the United States for sure. Um, okay, so we talked about that. Um, <clears throat> the European demand for the food fueled the supply due to cash, but they would wait on the coast of Africa. Okay. Um, so just kind of talking about um, the processes which the slaves were acquired. Um, so the process took place mostly in Central and West Africa, and what would take place, they would have these African slave merchants um, rounding up smaller tribes, um, even people that were kind of, you know, walking by themselves. They would round these people up, take them to um, British or Portuguese ports on the West Coast of Africa, and then sell them, and then that's when they would be transported to North America. Um, you know, we need to understand that this was something that became an institution within Africa over those 366 years. And it saw a lot of African elites rise in power and wealth and be able to obtain those luxury goods, you know, from the Indian Ocean um, trade <clears throat> in that way and, and receive things like silver for um, the slaves. And remember, during this time period, China had stabilized um, their economic system to take silver as the main... Um, as their, their only form of money. And so you see this rise in the amount of silver and that kind of affected it too because the Africans wanted some of those Chinese products too. So the numbers of slaves, um, they, they changed drastically um, from about the 16th century. Um, you saw about 3,000 annually. And then at the peak, it was somewhere right around a million um, between 1700 and 1850. Um, <clears throat> One thing that we should note is that there was frequent resistance by um, by those that were being rounded up and turned and um, 
brought into slavery. Something around the lines of one, one in ten, about ten to twelve percent of every um, shipment saw a revolt, a rebellion. There was constant turmoil. It was not an easy process. Um, in your Strayer book on page 274, there's a great chart that kind of shows the breakdown of that. Um, there was actually some that did end up getting free uh, lots of times. Um, one great um, one great example of that is, um, and is in Palmares, Brazil. And so these were called maroons and they would go out and they would maroon and kind of like hang out all on their own. And a great example of that colony was the Palmares of Brazil. And they were able to be slaves that freed themselves. Um, some of the consequences for Africa, at least for the most part, I, for Africa it was tough. The consequences that came from that is that political instability. Once, once slavery had ended in 1866, a lot of that funds that were coming into Africa also changed. And that really hurt the political structure. They did not see a, a, a population collapse similar to in North America down through South America simply because they were more um, tolerant to tropical diseases and smallpox and the things that the British were bringing along with them. Um, they had those antibodies and were able to survive. Um, the judicial systems were completely changed in Africa, especially during that time period. Um, it ended up being something more along the lines of you were looking to find people guilty so that you could trade them into slavery and make the elites more money within that specific area. Men were typically sold more than women and so the women in the African culture ended up having to carry a lot more of the manual labor, um, carry a lot more of the brunt of the work as we saw more and more men being shipped. Um, some of the women actually did see a rise in their social status and their political status um, through a marriage and it was called a signate or a mixed marriage. Um, and it offered some upward mobility for those um, for those women that would marry um, a colonizing person, a male, and then they would see their social structure rise. Some of them even owned slaves. Slaves, excuse me. Remember, this was a very very systematic um, process that had ingrained itself into the culture of Africa from the, in those 366 years. Okay, that is about the most. Um, that is about most of the like actual core material that I want you to kind of understand. But what I really want to think about is globalization and the impacts of, that slavery had. Um, global, slavery and the trade of slaves, may, a lot of the world ended up connecting because of that. If you think about Europe connecting with Africa, connecting with the North and South America, all of the continents were involved in this. And this this kind of constant global trade we saw continue and rise and continue throughout um, throughout after slavery into today. And our trade and our globalization that we see today is simply a continuation of the transatlantic slave system. And so when you start to think about tests and you start to think about um, if there's a question that talks about globalization and a global economy and how we got there and the, con the continuity and the change and how we got to this spot, um, the transatlantic slave system must be mentioned in that as the commerce between the two areas in a terrible, terrible market um, opened up these trade channels between you know, the West and the East and um, really kind of started what we now know as globalization. Um, I am going to finish off with a little bit more of Dance Macabre by Ghost. Um, this is a bad flower shirt. Thank you so much for watching. I um, hope that you have a great day. And remember, you're amazing and you're going to do absolutely amazing things.